Hello, and welcome to the Real American Revolution interview series with prominent authors and historians specializing in the colonial period and revolutionary America. This series is brought to you in cooperation with the American Revolution Consortium for Civic Education. Now, my name is Randy Flood, and today I'll be talking with historian Dr. Nancy K. Lone, author of the critically acclaimed award-winning book, Following the Drum, Women at the Valley Forge Encampment, published by Potomac Books in 2009. A former seasonal park ranger at Valley Forge National Historic Park, Nancy also writes about Valley Forge for the Journal of the American Revolution and several other publications. She's given almost 200 presentations throughout the country, including the Library of Congress, Colonial Williamsburg, and the David Library of the American Revolution, and has participated in four archaeological digs at Valley Forge National Historic Park. A member of the Valley Forge Park Alliance, Nancy is an honorary lifetime member of the Society of the Descendants of Washington's Army at Valley Forge and a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution. She's appeared on several radio shows as well as Pennsylvania Cable Network and C-SPAN and was also featured in the Martha Washington segment in the C-SPAN series about a nation's first ladies. So Nancy, welcome to the Real American Revolution and let's talk about the following the drum, Women at the Valley Forge Encampment. And it's wonderful to be here and thank you so much for the invitation. Delighted to have you. Well, Nancy, I really enjoyed following the drum. What inspired you to write this book? Well, let's see. Um, many years ago, my husband and I moved to Valley Forge from Miami, Florida. We moved in the wintertime. Soon after we moved in, we decided to go to Washington's headquarters where one of the rangers was standing and uh, said to him, kind of tongue in cheek, is, did Martha Washington sleep here? We all know there's a joke about George Washington sleeping here. So I said, well, did Martha Washington sleep here? I thought it was being very cute and funny. And he looked at me a little bit. Like, whoa. <laughs> and I uh, said, well, yes, Martha Washington did sleep here. And frankly, Randy, that's what got me interested in Valley Forge because I had uh, followed my husband for 26 years or so throughout the country as he went from place to place on jobs. And I was the trailing spouse. And it seemed to me that Martha Washington was the trailing spouse also. So Martha follows George. Nancy follows Tom, or I felt a real affinity to the woman. And that got me started thinking about Valley Forge and the women that were there. And then I went down to the library at Valley Forge National Historic Park, knocked on the door. The park historian, Joseph Lee Boyle, answered. And I said I was interested in learning about Martha Washington. And he invited me to come in and was very gracious about putting lots of material in front of me on the table. Never discussed what I should be thinking about, never pointed out things for me to look at. He just said things like, you might want to look at this. And I got started in researching about Martha Washington, which got me thinking about hmm, other women that came to Valley Forge and from there, it branched out into my research and studies about Valley Forge itself. And um, I'm, just, I'm just very taken with the topic. I love Valley Forge. I love talking about Valley Forge. And my goal right now is to get people to see Valley Forge in technicolor, not just black and white. I think we have lots of stories about Valley Forge, lots of myths about Valley Forge that are just not true. And I'd like to help to dispel those myths. Um, the book, Following the Drum, Women at the Valley Forge Encampment, is the first one that was ever written about the women that came to camp. We know that many, many, many books have been written about Valley Forge, but no one had touched the subject about the women that came to camp. And most people, in fact, don't even realize that women were at Valley Forge until hopefully they open the pages of the book following the drum women at the Valley Forge Encampment and have a big aha experience. <laughs> women were there and ladies mm -hmm. were there. So that's how I got to Valley Forge. That's how I became interested in the subject and it's um, a passion that's con continued to this day. It's terrific. Who exactly were Nancy, the, the camp followers at Valley Forge and why were they there? Yeah, now we have several 
names for them, camp followers, camp women, women of the army. These were are all people of the lower sort, as they were called, uh, the lower class. They came to Valley Forge, I believe, and have no real hard evidence on this, but do have some evidence. Uh, most of the women came because their husbands were at camp. And they came because, frankly, they had nowhere else to go. It was a very dangerous time during the Revolutionary War for a woman to be at home alone with her children um, while both armies, both armies were traipsing back and forth uh, across the country. That was a very dangerous time for them. And so a woman would go to camp following her husband uh, because uh, camp offered her safety. It offered her some food. It offers, offered her a place to work and hopefully safety, food, and um, for her children too. Because of course the women very often were not just traveling by themselves, they were traveling with children with them too. Um, so that's why most of the women, I believe, of the army, the women, the camp followers came to Valley Forge. Now, of course, once they got there, there was a question of what were they doing? And Washington did not want them to do anything else except to work for the army, to wash for the army, to cook for the army, to mend for the army, to nurse the soldiers. That is what they were supposed to be doing. And if they did that, um, they would be get, getting paid and they would be given rations. And so most of the women, I think, were there doing those. Of course, we do have some women of ill repute that were at Valley Forge also. And we even know some of their names because they were put on trial for um, their actions, their indiscretions at Valley Forge. But mm -hmm. most of the women that were there, and there were at least 400, at least 400 women that came to Valley Forge on the 19th of December of 1777 one of the officers calls the women at the army a caravan of wild beasts. A caravan of wild beasts. Wow. That's how he describes them. <laughs> and if you think about it, Randy, they were given no clothing by the army. They had very minimal rations. We're not quite sure where they were sleeping. So these were not these women, as our rank and file soldiers, were really living on the edge of poverty mm -hmm. and really living on the very edge. So women of the army, yeah, camp, camp women. Well, well, General Washington really didn't think very much of women in camp. Did he write about them? What, what were his thoughts? Uh, did he leave anything uh, about writing about his thoughts, sharing his thoughts? <laughs> We do have a very few bits of snippets of what Washington thought about the army women. Uh, we know one thing that the women of ill repute were brought to trial. So we know he didn't want them there to trial. Uh, we also know that at one point um, he, uh, he said that they were a scourge upon every movement and that's because they were at the very end of the army as it moved from place to place. And who were with them? The children. So you know they were not able to move quickly. Washington did not want them on the wagons. So of course they would drag the army along as they tried to get the kids to move along quickly with them. And Washington did think of them as a scourge upon every movement. At one point, he finally decided, or the Congress finally decided how many rations they would get. And they would get in a company of men, they would have 15 extra rations for the women, but that didn't work out at all because sometimes they had a lot more women there than 15 rations would provide. And sometimes they had fewer. And the men who as wives were not getting fed said, you don't feed my wife and I'm not staying either. I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. And Washington said, we have to do better than this because we are going to lose some of the best men of our army because their wives are not being fed. So we have to think about a different plan. And finally, at the very end of the revolution, they finally make plans for how much of the women were to get fed. But 
they were an afterthought. <laughs> the women were an afterthought. Yeah. He did mm -hmm. not want them, didn't want to be seen with the army. Um, as I said, he felt they just moved far too slowly. They dragged down the army. And yet, Randy, think about what those women did. If Washington wanted his soldiers clean, who was going to wash for them? It was the women with the army. Mm -hmm. If he wanted his soldiers to look neat and have buttons sewed on, who was going to do that? The women with the army. If his soldiers got sick, he did not want to take soldiers out of the field. He instead wanted the women to take care of them. So he needed the women. Mm -hmm. He needed the women. Well, he certainly made some personal exceptions, perhaps with his own military family. Can you talk about a, about some of the women that traveled with Washington's immediate family and the people that, uh, you know, provided services uh, that he might have to have, like uh, ironing or uh, washing or whatever? Sure. And and this too, Randy, with when I uh, went through this search, suddenly it just dawned on me how very class conscious the 18th century was and how very structured uh, the army was as far as uh, classes, because at the very bottom, we have the women of the lower sort who are traveling with their husbands. Then we also have women who um, are also of the lower sort, as we say, but traveling with Washington. So they would have instantly a certain status. He travels with a housekeeper, for example. She's 74 years old when she comes to Valley Forge, Mrs. Elizabeth Thompson. He thinks very highly of her and she thinks very highly of him. She's a worthy Irish woman, as he describes her, a worthy Irish woman, 74 years old at Valley Forge. And at one point he fires her Martha Washington, this is during the war, not at just at Valley Forge, but during the Revolutionary War. He fires her. Martha Washington, who's only five feet tall, looks up at George, who's 6'2", or maybe 6'4", somewhere in there, and says, honey, I wish you would not have fired Mrs. Thompson because I could have used her at Mount Vernon. And then Washington writes around to saying to people, Mrs. Washington wishes I would have told her that I was going to get Mrs. Thompson go. Do you know where she is? Can you let her find her for me? <laughs> and they do find her and bring her back to Washington and he hires her again. So he travels with a housekeeper, 74 at Valley Forge. He travels with a cook, Anna Till, with her husband. She's either a free black woman or a slave. There's some discussion about that. Um, and she's interviewed at the age of 102 mm. for the Annals of Philadelphia. And the person who's interviewing her says she speaks with more vigor and better recall than almost anyone I have, I have interviewed. And she was 102 years old, Hannah Amazing. Till. Amazing. And I have to say too that Hannah Till um, worked for seven years during the Revolutionary War. And she worked for Lafayette as well as General Washington. According to her, she far preferred Lafayette to Washington. Interesting. Yes, she Interesting. preferred Lafayette to Washington. But the reason may have been because Lafayette allegedly paid the mortgage off on her house in Philadelphia. Oh. Well, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that could have been the reason. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. And he had a laundress too, didn't he? He did. And, and she was um, a friend, possibly married to William Lee, who was um, his own personal slave. Mm -hmm. Yes. So those are the people that we know for sure, the women that are traveling with Washington as he goes from place to place. Remember that he lives in at least, at least 150 places during the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. So Mrs. Elizabeth Thompson would have had a very busy time trying to um, set up all these homes for him. And um, she took care of setting them up if they went from place to place. Mm -hmm. Well, Nancy, let's talk about the spouses of the senior officers, those uh, in the highest command around Washington who also traveled to Valley Forge. Did the wives travel to Valley Forge specifically along with their husbands in that instance and other winter encampments as well? Yeah, um, most of the time, no. Most of the time, once the army got settled in, 
the husbands would write to their wives and say, as Washington did, and I'm paraphrasing, I cannot come to you. If you want to see me, you're going to need to travel to me. So Mrs. Washington packed up and traveled to, to all of the eight winter encampments to be with her husband. Um, she, of course, was away from Mount Vernon for five years of the Revolutionary War, traveling to the encampments, staying at the encampments, being inoculated uh, against smallpox. So she very much traveled her man, with her man as she went from place to place. Lafayette, by the way, says that Mrs. Washington is mad about the general. <laughs> mad about the general. And General Nathaniel Green says Mrs. Washington is very happy in General Washington and he is very happy in her. They are very happy in each other. So why the heck is Mrs. Washington traveling? all these distances, all these times to be with General Washington because she really likes this guy. In fact, you even mm -hmm. say that she loves this guy. Now these are the elite ladies. Mm -hmm. The elite ladies at camp are doing very different things than the women of the lower sort. We have Martha Washington, an elite Virginia lady at, at camp. We have Katie Green, the wife of General Nathaniel Green. She leaves her two children at home. They do not come to camp, but Katie Green herself loves the life of the army. And she's very excited to be <laughs> at army. So much more going on there than in Rhode Island, you know? Uh -huh. <laughs> Katie Green is a real flirt. She spoke French. The French officers very much like to chatter away in French with her. And one of them gives her eight volumes of French comedy because he thinks mm -hmm. so much of her. So Katie Green comes to camp, a good friend of Martha Washington's, by the way. But probably an even better friend is, is Mrs. Henry Knox, Lucy Knox, also a higher echelon, comes to Valley Forge, brings with her her two-year-old daughter, little Lucy, who is the youngest person that I know that is at camp. So we have a, an elite group of ladies at a camp. We have women that travel with Washington's army, and then and we also have the women that travel uh, with the army itself. By the way, probably one of the very first people that die at Valley Forge is a woman, because as the army is coming into camp on the 19th of December of 1777, one of the officers writes that a wagon overturns and a woman is killed. Mm. And that would have been one of the camp women. Mm -hmm. And it's really surprising that even that he even writes about that because um, officers don't think much of the women with the army. Remember, a scourge upon every movement, a caravan, a wild beast. That's how they're looked upon. But probably one of the first, uh, one of the first of the 2,000 people that die at Valley Forge mm -hmm. is a woman. And she's, she's killed coming into camp. Interesting. You also bring up in your book a number of other ladies of the officers, uh, the wives, uh, such as Lady Sterling uh, yeah. and uh, Rebecca Biddle and uh, Alice Lee Shippen. Um, did these women, I mean, tell us a little bit about some of the, the, the lesser known wives of these officers. And secondly, did they, uh, did they gather for dancing or did they socialize or did they have their own little groups or their teas or uh, instances where they would congregate or get together? Yeah, um, yeah, there are a couple other ladies that we know about, but uh, we don't know much about any of those people. For example, um, Mrs. Biddle, she comes with her husband, Clement Biddle, and he's the uh, person who's in charge of the forage, the general for the forage. Um, she has several children. They do not come with her to camp. There is a story about her shooting down uh, pigeons and also uh, um, uh, down with the brandywine, but there's probably no likelihood to that story whatsoever. Uh, we know that uh, she also um, very died uh, in bankruptcy because unfortunately a lot of the, our officers during the war gave a lot of money during the Revolutionary War to have things go well. And her husband wanted them to do that and did that, so she died in bankruptcy. We don't know too much more about though, Mrs. Biddle. 
unfortunately. We know a little bit more about Mrs. Sterling, Lord Sterling's wife. Um, she came from herself with a lot of money. They have a wonderful home near Basking Ridge, New Jersey. She came to Valley Forge with her daughter, who's Kitty. They called her Kate in the family, but Kitty is the way she was normally referred to. And Kitty's friend, who was named Nancy. And these were um, mm -hmm. early 20-year-old women probably came to camp because guess who was there? A lot of officers and probably a lot of those officers were eligible. So how much fun was that, you know? <laughs> so, so we have uh, Mrs. Sterling yeah. coming to camp with, with Nancy and with Kitty and, uh, and that's what they did. Now later on, um, Mrs. Sterling's older daughter, Mary, marries a British officer and she, Mrs. Sterling, is able to go behind the lines to visit her, which was very gracious mm -hmm. of the British uh, to allow that to happen. She also died destitute in uh, 1791. Lord Sterling liked to live large. He liked to live big. But unfortunately, when he died, he had very little money left. And so the family was really destitute. Mm -hmm. So... That's what happened to her. And Alice Lee Shippen is from the Lees of Virginia. Uh, she comes to camp as she goes to several other camps. We know that she's up in the Mannheim area and the Reading area, for example. We also know that she is very much a lady, very, very class conscious and wants to make sure that her daughter, Nancy, is uh, one of the very finest ladies in all of Philadelphia by the time the, the war is over. And so what happens there is there are several letters written back and forth, <laughs> several letters written back and forth uh, from um, Dr. Shippen, because that's who she's married to, Dr. Shippen, who says things like this, your mother wants to know, and he's writing from Valley Forge, your mother wants to know, are you learning how to enter a room properly? He's writing to his daughter who's in finishing <laughs> school. Are you learning how to leave a room properly? Are you learning how to sit? Are you learning how to stand? And do not wa wear a bow on your shoulder. It will make you crooked. Now, I think this is really amazing that a woman at Valley Forge is so forward thinking that she's sure that the American army is going to win. But she also wants to ensure that her daughter, Nancy, is going to be one of the finest women in all of Philadelphia. And for that to happen, Nancy is going to have to pay a lot of attention to her posture, not to wear any bow on her shoulder, to enter her room properly, to leave a room properly. And her father is saying to her, this is what your mother wants to have happen and make sure that you do these things, Nancy. Unfortunately, Alice Lee Shippen herself spirals into decline, has mental problems, and Nancy yeah. too has mental problems. So uh, although Nancy may have been a very fine lady, she had a real struggle with some mental things. So mm -hmm. yes, but there definitely are, Randy, this is a very class conscious thing. And I, mm -hmm. I do emphasize this, mm -hmm. that uh, the ladies are going to be doing very different things than the women uh, camp followers are going to be doing. They are going to be socializing among themselves. They have their portraits painted. They go to the French Alliance and they serve in, in the middle of tea. Uh, they attend the theater. None of the camp women are going to be doing any of those things. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, there's some stories, perhaps myths, that Katie Green danced with General Washington for over three hours at one time. Is that true? That's true, but it's not at Valley Forge. Oh, it's okay. at the next encampment. It's at the Middlebrook encampment. Middlebrook, okay. Yes, there is. Somebody, at least two people write about that, uh, that he does dance with Katie Green for three hours straight without even sitting down once. General Nathaniel <laughs> Green says the same thing. However, Mrs. Washington was there too. So I guess she's a very uh, forgiving person. You know, if you want to uh -huh. dance with Katie, honey, go right ahead. I'll sit here and talk to some other people. 
And by the way, I think that Katie Green would have loved to have danced with George Washington for three hours straight. I think that uh -huh. she would have enjoyed that immensely. But that does not happen at Valley Forge. There is no dancing at Valley. Um, as Duponso says, the enemy is very close and mm -hmm. there are not, no frivolity here. We do sing when they got together, the ladies and the gentlemen and the senior officers got together, they went, got together for singing and so they would sing, but there was no dancing. There was camp theater, but soon afterwards the Congress uh, uh, struck out camp theater too and said, no, this is mm -hmm. war. Our officers, because they were the ones that did the camp theater, our officers are, should be paying attention to what's going on with the British and the war. They are not to be acting in theater, theatrical productions. Mm -hmm. So that was also eliminated. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But Valley Forge is a third of the eight encampments. And so we're still working through all of these. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> well, another story told is that Martha Washington and that the wives of some of the senior officers visited and sometimes cared for the sick in their huts. Now, is that true? No. It is not. And I'm delighted that you asked that question, Ron, because <laughs> that's one of my favorite questions. And I have an entire chapter in the book, Making the Myth of yep. Martha. Lots of alliteration here, as you can see, Making the Myth of Martha. Um, that tells what's wrong with this myth. The myth starts, uh, I think, because of Benson John Losing, who's writing get this, more than 100 years after Valley Forge, wow. saying that he has interviewed someone who went with Martha Washington uh, to visit the soldiers. But when you read the letters and the journals and the diaries of the time, which is all I look at, the original primary sources, you see that absolutely nobody mentions, including George Washington, Martha Washington, any of the other officers, any of the ladies, anybody visiting camp, anybody uh, writes about Martha Washington and the ladies or any of the ladies visiting among the soldiers. Remember, this is a very class conscious society. Martha Washington is the elite Virginia lady. They have nothing to do with women of the lower sort. Lucy Knox actually walked on the other side of the street when she came across women of the lower sort. We would love to think that this is something Martha Washington could do because this is something we in the 21st century would do, right? Mm -hmm. We know that Mrs. Biden, for example, took cookies to those that were the, uh, of the guard that were in the Capitol. She took cookies to them. That would be a nice thing for someone to do. And that's what she did. But Martha Washington, very elite lady, very class conscious, had nothing to do with those um, soldiers. And in Making the Myth of Martha, the last chapter of my book, I trace how the story got started. Uh, someone writes about 35 years after Valley Forge that Martha Washington uh, did nice things. Someone writes a little letter, nice things for the soldiers. Then 50 years after Valley Forge, Mrs. Washington is visiting the soldiers at Valley Forge. And then someone else says how she's doing this at all the encampments. See, it's like a whisper down the lane type of thing. Mm -hmm. And following, we have Benson John Losing who says, aha, I actually interviewed someone who went with Martha Washington, but it's more than 100 years later. And nobody, nobody writes about this. Mm -hmm. So I ask, I beg, I beg people to rethink the whole thing about Martha Washington. <laughs> I think it's enough for her, frankly, to have gone with to, to all the encampments. She was away from Mount Vernon for five years. That's a tremendous commitment that she's made to the mm -hmm. army and to the cause. And uh, a great, um, I think it shows wonderful devotion on her mm -hmm. part. Well, that sounds and, like uh, your favorite, uh, that sounds like your favorite chapter in the book. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. Because once again, as the book is the first book ever written about Valley Forge, this is the first time that this chapter is the first time anyone has gone step by step by step mm -hmm. by step, showing how this myth was made, and hopefully laying out in a convincing style that this is something for us to think about. Mm -hmm. Interesting. 
Well, speaking of myths, uh, what are some of the popular misconceptions or myths that have grown up that have been perpetuated about the winter at Valley Forge? Well, there's another word that you mentioned right there, the winter at Valley Forge. Okay. <laughs> uh, and with winter, you think of winter weather, which in the Valley Forge area, southeastern Pennsylvania is snow, ice, yes. So yes, there was some snow. Yes, there was some ice. But what usually you have instead is mud. This was a moderate, muddy Pennsylvania winter. And my dear sweet husband um, did some research. He went back and looked at the records over 100 years ago and averaged the average temperature for winter over 100 years and then looked at the Valley Forge winter and saw that the Valley Forge winter was actually two degrees higher than the average temperature over the past 100 years. This is not a terribly horrible winter. And when you chart it out, which my, again, my wonderful husband did, you saw, see that there are only three days that are 10 degrees or below during the entire winter. And what usually happens is when it does snow, when it's icy, when you get the 10 degree weather, degrees weather, what happens is that the um, temperature starts to rise, goes up and things melt. And that's when you get the mud mire. Mm -hmm. Soldiers write about being in their huts with mud up to their ankles. Somebody even writes about being in mud up to his knees you know and the problem there becomes of course how are you going to get the wagons through mud mm -hmm. that's very very difficult and that was one of the supply problems there so that's certainly one of the myths at valley forge think of martha that's a myth think of the weather that's a myth too <laughs> and i don't know of too many people again that have looked at at the weather at valley forge in the same way that we have but i i think there's I think we need to rethink that also. By the way, I must say that Washington writes about the soldiers making bloody footprints in the snow. Mm -hmm. And that can be very true. That can be true. However, a week later, they're going to be clumping along in the mud. So, uh -huh. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> well, Nancy, people really like following the drum. Why do you think that is the case? Why do you think it's so popular? Well, first of all, I thank you for saying that. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy that people do like it. it I, it has gone from being a hardback to a paperback. And of course it's also on Kindle or something like that also online. I think people like it if you like history because it's easy to read. And also because it, it, it only has the primary sources in it. And I mean, it's the original research. It's the, it's the new, it's the, it's the letters and the journals and the diaries of the time. It's not something that a contemporary historian has said. And I'm quoting again, I go back to the original sources and look at the primary stuff. But that's what's so exciting because when you do go back to the original sources, what do you see? All kinds of great stuff, right? Yeah. Like Martha Washington didn't visit the soldiers. <laughs> like the weather wasn't really so awful. It was muddy rather than snowy and icy. Mm -hmm. And that's what's making research so exciting. But it also means, Randy, that sometimes I come across things that are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. I never even thought about this. So one day I might think definitely one thing and another day I sometimes I have to shift my position mm -hmm. slightly. <laughs> but it's, it's very exciting and every yeah, day's yeah. new. Sure. What's the most important thing that people should uh, take away about your about your uh, book on women at Valley Forge? What should people well, remember? Well, I would love people to rethink the whole Martha myth. I truly would. Mm -hmm. I would like people to do that. And I also would like people just to read history with an open mind. If you read somebody like Benson John Losing, who is writing more than 100 more more than 100 years after Valley Forge and say, oh my goodness, Martha must have visited the huts because it says so right here in this book. Consider what you're looking at. How authoritative is something that's written 100 years later? Is, so that's, I think, what people like, would 
I would like them to think about. Just to have a very open mind when you're reading these things. Read critically. Don't think that everything that you see on a written page or on television is right. Ask the source. And where mm -hmm. did they get that information? And sure. does it all make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Well, Nancy, you were involved in a number of archaeological digs at Valley Forge Historic Park. What did you learn from that experience? Oh, that was fun. You know, that's, that's, there it is. It comes from the ground and it was, went in the ground in the 18th century. How cool is that? Um, I was. Um, probably the most important one that I was on was in the Wainswood area. You can tell that they didn't trust me at all, though, because I had two archaeologists on, one archaeologist on either side. So I was surrounded by archaeologists <laughs> as I was digging in there. <laughs> and um, what we were looking for and what was discovered that we found was a camp cooking area. So we went down about, I would say, about a foot and a half or so, maybe not even that that far and saw pieces of lantern glass and pieces from pottery and a chain, a link, a link from a chain. And the archeologist said, oh, what we're doing here is, is uh, working on excavating a camp kitchen area. Mm -hmm. This was the chain that would hold a kettle and of course a lantern, you'd have lots of lanterns and a little piece of pottery thing. So it was it, you know, just incredibly exciting to think about people from the Revolution of Art, from the Valley Forge period, using those things and, and uncovering them. You know, Randy, years ago, people used to come to Valley Forge with their metal detectors and that was okay. Mm -hmm. In fact, I understand they would even rent out metal detectors not too far from yeah. that. And whatever you found, you could keep. But I tell you what, don't try that now. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, examining not a good idea. <laughs> examining artifacts kind of brings history al alive, don't you think? Oh, doesn't it, though? And they found all <laughs> kinds of wonderful things, not me personally, but others. Dice that are made out of a little musket balls. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't imagine Washington was not very excited about that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that uh, they found that was very exciting were the little buttons, the USA buttons. Mm -hmm. And uh, the archeologists thought, well, you know, I guess if the uniforms can't all be the same, maybe they can have buttons that are mm -hmm. the same. So yeah, <laughs> really fun stuff. And there's always something new. Mm -hmm. That's what makes history very exciting. Absolutely. Well, Nancy, do you have anything else in the works? Uh, your next book, perhaps? Yeah, I've been working on for several years a book called Beneath the Snow, Beneath the Snow, because I want people to look deeper at Valley Forge. So it's 10 chapters about Valley Forge. And I look um, seriously at the weather. I gave you a little smidgekin as we were talking about right. the weather was like. The first days at camp, what happened then? What did they have to do to put together one of the largest cities in the, in the country? Because that's what Valley Forge was, one of the very largest cities in America, North America. What did they have to do for that? Then I also talk about the happiest day camp, which is the uh, French when they celebrate the French Alliance, the holiest day camp, how they celebrate Christmas and what went on there. Uh, the last days of camp, what has to happen there. Um, talking uh, about Steuben, who I admire very much as an individual. And then there are a couple other chapters that I have too, talking about the food and the clothing and all that. Mm -hmm. So, if I ever get this book done, which I hope to, um, I think too, this book also will kind of explode Valley Forge because it, using only the primary sources, it gives you a lot of information about this place that most people only think about as soldiers huddled by their fires. Mm -hmm. And it's so much more than that. Well, I can't wait to read it. <laughs> me too. <laughs> well, Nancy, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a real pleasure to have you on The Real American Revolution. And uh, I love this. Thank you so much, Randy. I appreciate the opportunity and come to visit Valley Forge. Oh, absolutely. I can't wait to get there. <laughs> Thanks to our viewers as well. And to our viewers, we've been talking with Dr. Nancy K. Lone, author of Following the Drum, 
women at the Valley Forge encampment. Be sure to join us next time when the Real American Revolution will bring you another exciting interview about what really happened during our war for independence. My name is Randy Flood, and so long for now. Bye. <laughs>